So, um, my name is Maddie Schultz. I am a product manager here at Databricks. And uh, welcome to our uh, first Apache Spark event. Uh, this is not just first Apache Spark, but um, this is an event where we have all women speakers. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> How exciting is that? Um, and I'm super excited to also announce that this is in partnership with the Big Data uh, Women uh, Meetup that uh, you know some of you might have attended. Um, they're, they have really amazing events in the Bay Area and actually throughout the country. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, you know who, who are these three accomplished uh, women speakers that we have today. Uh, but before I actually dive into that, let's give a big hand to the organizing team here at Databricks. That's uh, Jen, uh, Diane, we have Veronica, uh, uh, Brenna, Jules, and uh, the rest of the team. Let's give them a big hand for organizing this event. All right, so uh, I want to introduce uh, you to our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Colleen Lewis. She's here. Uh, she's an assistant professor at, uh, for computer science at Harvey Mudd College. And she actually was here uh, about a month ago, and you guys are in for a treat. This is an amazing, amazing talk. Lower the standards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, she actually frequently, uh, you know, talks about diversity and inclusion. And uh, uh, last year, you were at uh, Grace Hopper and won an award there uh, for uh, for yeah, woo, for an emerging leader award. Uh, she also has talked at uh, South by Southwest, another a popular event. Um, and, and many others that I won't go into. But Colleen's research is mainly focused on uh, just about computer science, like how people feel about learning computer science and how, how they actually like react and, and work with uh, you know, other computer scientists while they're doing that. And she's going to give us a, um, a, a very nice talk today about how do you fit into computer science just with the stereotypes. And if you don't fit into stereotypes, like what does that look for you uh, in a computer science world? So let's give her a big, big hand and welcome Colleen. Thank you so much. Okay, and we'll start just lowering the expectations just like a tiny bit, like it'll be okay. And I'll, but I'll try and stay on time. I'll give you that, yeah? Okay, so um, like she said, I'm a computer science professor at Harvey Mudd College. We're just in LA, uh, east of LA, about an hour. Uh, and we're a small liberal arts school. Um, and I want to, okay, so my research is about computer science education, how people learn computer science, how people feel about learning computer science. And we're going to start and we're going to talk about some of the, uh, like broader picture things of diversity and inclusion in computer science. And then it turns out that Harvey Mudd has like a ton of women in computer science, like half of our uh, faculty in the CS department are women and about half of our students are women. And you're gonna be like, what? And I'm gonna be like, oh, here's what we did and it's really not that complicated. Do you know what I mean in terms of like, oh, like it's, it, it turns out it's not rocket science. Like literally women are more than half of the population of the earth. And it turns out we just didn't turn them away in computer science at Harvey Mudd. Uh, yes, okay, team. So let's do this. I have not a lot of minutes, and I'm going to talk too quickly. But I am going to put, oh, I think they're videotaping it. That's nice. And so you could probably watch it in like half time speed if this is too fast. And um, my slides are going to be posted or are posted in a PDF form on Twitter. Okay, so. Little context, uh, I went to Cal undergrad, electrical engineering, computer science, whoop whoop. And then I worked at Capgemini as an IT consultant. So it was fun-ish. And then I worked at LeapFrog. Have people heard of LeapFrog? Yeah, uh, yeah that was a good place to work. Uh, so we made educational games and I was a software engineer there. And on the weekends I was teaching people computer science. Uh, and I was like, oh, what if I went back to grad school and researched how people learn computer science? So I went back to Berkeley. Actually, I know a bunch of the Databricks founders uh, through Berkeley, and I did my master's in CS and my PhD in education. And then I was like, oh, what if I got a job and had to leave the Bay Area? Um, and, but now I live in Southern California, and I work at Harvey Mudd College, where I said, we've got a bunch of women studying computer science at more super small school, 820 students. Okay. No. I think for impact, I should say like 821. You know, just like really precise. Okay. Let me tell you about my experience, and I would guess that other folks, some folks in the room have had a similar experience, where people are like, Colleen, this was when I was 18, and I was like, yeah, computer science. People were like, Colleen, you won't like sitting in a basement, coding until 3 in the morning. And I am like awake at 5 in the morning, 
and like tonight's gonna be kind of a late night for me. And so they were right that I didn't want to be coding at three in the morning. And I don't, does anyone in this room like basements? <laughs> like, and has any software engineer like literally ever worked all by themselves? Like that's not what we do. And so there were all these people who were telling me I, I liked computer science and I would tell them that and then they would tell me that I wasn't gonna like computer science. And they're like, what is happening there? Do you know what I mean? Raise your hand if anyone ever told you not to do computer science. Yeah, I, I noticed some patterns. I didn't realize until my senior year of college that this wasn't just like a thing that happened to people people. Do you know what I mean? I was like, oh, well, I just sort of don't fit their expectations because I'm a people person. And so people are like, you can't do computer science. But I think that's not, I think that's not the only piece. It's like you look at me and you're like, oh, when I picture, when I close my eyes and I picture a computer scientist, is it me? <laughs> Maybe not. And I think actually for a lot of people, uh, the, the stereotypes just aren't so flattering. So for me, that's like as unhappy as I look on a photo in the internet, so that's all I had. But I feel like this might be what people picture, and actually the stereotypes are even worse. So in some of my research, I've interviewed students about their interest in computer science, and the student was like, you have to be able to uh, make it your lifestyle. You can't just do it as a side thing. You have to be thinking about it all the time. And I love computer science, but I'm not like, let me have no other interests. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I don't know any computer scientists who have no other interests. But culturally, we have all these narratives about computer scientists as being like really shallow, unpleasant people, right? Like, like we don't shower. <laughs> Everyone in here seems to have showered. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, there, there are things that I would guess that everybody has some dimension of these negative stereotypes of being completely obsessed, having no other interests, never showering, not being capable of talking to other humans. Like, I think that I probably listed at least one thing where you were like, oh yeah, I'm a computer scientist, but that doesn't fit for me. Yeah? So um, this researcher, Karen Ashcraft at the University of Colorado Boulder talks about the idea and the ways in which these stereotypes create a glass slipper. So the glass slipper captures this idea of who we expect to do computer science or any profession. She also studies aviation pilots. Um, and there's this glass slipper, and for some people it just fits, and some people it doesn't. And so this was me in, co oh, it's very blurry, I'm sorry, but this was me in college. I was like, computer science, it's so fun. And then I try to put my foot in, and I'm like, oh, I don't fit. I'm not what people are expecting as a computer scientist. Um, and there are consequences for that, and we'll talk through some of those pieces. Um, and other people, Raise your hand if, any, if no one has ever seemed surprised that you're a computer scientist. There's got to... <laughs> Raise your... Oh, I'm a professor, do you know what I mean? So I like expect a little more interaction than this. Raise your hand if you live in the Bay Area. That's great. Rip the band-aid off, and now the next time maybe you won't be so shy about raising your hand. I'm sure there are people who like, yeah, okay, whatever, <laughs> team. Here's the weird thing, is the first seven computer scientists were all women. The women who programmed the ENIAC were all women. Oh, this is a little redundant, but, and here's the thing, is culturally women, oh, programming was seen as women's work. It was like needlepoint, it's very detail-oriented. And it's interesting the ways in which that has shifted. And if you look at the participation of women in the physical sciences, medical school, and law school, it's all gone from like really low numbers uh, in the like 1965 to about 45 to 50 percent. And women's participation in the red line was on that same trajectory with computer science until 1985-ish. Personal computers. People wanted to sell personal computers. And do you know who they marketed them to? They marketed them to the lone wolf in a basement. Uh, and with that, like people are trying to make money selling these computers, and they designed an explicit advertising campaign targeting specific consumers. And that, and other things that Nathan Ensminger talks about in his book, The Computer Boys Take Over, 
uh, were other things that help us understand, like, yo, know, what happened in 1985, and like, why are we not on the same trajectory? What's unique about the stories that we tell about computer scientists uh, that is really like leading to women not participating? <coughs> Team, the end. I'm going to recommend a lot of books. The end slide, I promise, is just like a list of all the books. And remember, the slides are going to be up online. OK. Team, have people heard this term? Raise your hand if you've heard the term microaggression. Yeah? OK, so here's the idea. I got not a lot of hands, but it, maybe more people have heard of it than that. And it's this idea that people are saying stuff that they don't mean to be a jerk necessarily, but it maybe feels like they're being a jerk. Uh, so one example is when I hear, you're a computer scientist. And that tone of surprise, maybe this seems weird, but it doesn't feel nice. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I like to swim. And people are like, you're a swimmer? And I'm like, that's not a nice thing to seem surprised about, people. You, you exercise? And it's similar to be like, oh, I just don't fit for you in this computer science bubble. And implicitly, you're telling me that I don't belong. And that's fine if it happens once. But literally, if it happens every time I talk to anybody, like, raise your hand if you just don't tell people what you do. Like, do you know what I mean? I'm just like super aloof when I go and interact, when I go to the doctor, when I go to the dentist, or when I get my hair cut. You just avoid the topic so that you don't have to face this. Raise your hand if you've been told you got the job because of your gender. I know very few women where that's not the case. And maybe, maybe that's a computer science professor thing, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Like some, you know, uh, as professors, you apply for tenure, like, oh, can I keep my job forever? And people have been like, oh yeah, Colleen, it makes sense. You are not worried about getting tenure. You're a woman. And I'm like, I do find my lady parts are helpful in my teaching and research. It's just like, what? Okay. And the last piece that I hear is women are better at blank. Oh, it's great to hire women because women are great collaborators. And I'm like, oh, all women? Do you know what I mean? Like, that seems weird that like all women would be great collaborators. Is there like a, a woman cookie cutter that we're all made out of? And so like one pinch collaboration and like mm, two pinches of smart, but not three pinches of smart. Like we, we buy into these narratives about who women are, what women can be, and what women do in these really isolating ways. This is my cookie cutter. <laughs> and so like whenever you hear these stereotypes of like, oh, women are great at blank, or and it seems like a compliment, <clears throat> just be like, oh, maybe there's more variation than that. And even if there's a difference in the mean collaborativeness for men and women, maybe they are still overlapping bell curves, right? As like data scientists. You think about bell curves and overlapping bell curves, and only fools don't think about effect sizes, right? But you are not fools, and so don't buy into this nonsense. Yeah? Okay. National Center for Women and Information Technology, NC WIT, uh, I think I have another animation that says that, their website, they have a recommendation. Whenever anyone says this nonsense, like, you're a computer scientist, for me, I feel like bunched in the stomach. And I don't quite know what to say. And I want to say something witty. Uh, I'm like biting back, and I can't. But I can say, what makes you say that? And it buys me some time. Someone says some like racist, sexist nonsense. I say, what makes you say that? And it just buys me some time. So that's my pro tip to you all. You're not sure whether to intervene, what to say, etc. What makes you say that? Um, <clears throat> OK. So Harvey Mudd, that's, we're transitioning a little bit. I want to be like, oh, you know, this stuff that we're doing at Harvey Mudd, it's like not so complicated. And I think it has some meta lessons for thinking about diversity and inclusion uh, outside of the college institution. OK, so here's a thing that happens to me like at basically every conference. People are like, oh, I've heard you have a lot of women in CS at Mudd. And I'm like, yep. Yeah. And they're like, we don't. We must be doing something wrong. And I'm like, no, but legit, probably. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Raise your hand if you like have a ton of women in engineering at your job. 
Sweet. The rest of you probably work at companies where you're doing something wrong. And that's cool. Do you know what I mean? Like, you probably don't mean to do things wrong, but you probably want to go to uh, NC Wit and be like, oh, like people legit study this and they have workbooks for me to work through to be like, how can we make our company less toxic for women? How can we not perpetuate these stereotypes that are leading to women not getting leadership roles or da 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 da? Team. So at Harvey Mudd, you know, we were like, well, we want some women, and so we'll just make everything pink. Yeah? And you're like, solid decision there. <laughs> solid. <laughs> Turns out, no. Uh, we didn't make anything pink, but we were like, oh, what if, what if women weren't necessarily different than men? Do you know what I mean? Like, what if, what if they could be interested in computer science? And maybe we're seeing that they're not interested in computer science, but what if they could be? And even you can think about... Uh, in the US, we talk about like women are bad at math, right? Like even some Barbies said that at the time and there were t-shirts that, do you guys remember these little uppers? Math is hard, no? Okay, whatever. So we've got this stereotype that women are bad at math. I'm not afraid to like call it out, right? Uh, here's the thing is you're like, oh, do you know what I've heard to substantiate that? I've heard that on the math SAT, men score better than women. And you're like, oh, oh, weird, right? Why would men be better at math than women? And you're like, oh, tell me more. And one, they might mention like, oh, that actually hasn't been true for 15 years. They might not mention that. And then if you dig a little deeper, you're like, oh, but like, you know, they're, the means of those two populations of men and women, how different are those means? Oh, it's a quarter of a question on the exam. A quarter of a question. On average, a man is going to get a quarter of a, 15 years ago, is going to get a quarter of a question more right on the SAT than a woman. But we have like a statistically illiterate population where they're not thinking about effect sizes. Do you know what I mean? And they're not thinking about, yeah, there's a statistically significant difference between the means, but is that a meaningless difference? Perhaps. Should we use it to inform our beliefs about the potential and abilities of literally over half the world's population? Maybe not. And I also want to pause and be like, oh, it turns out not everybody identifies as a man or a woman. Uh, and so some of these examples, I think, are like sort of uh, gen like uh, reinforcing a gender binary, which I don't mean to do. I'm sorry. OK, okay so we didn't turn everything pink, spoiler alert. Uh, we did try to show the breadth of computer science because it turns out a lot of intro computer science courses are like Java programming and like I teach Java programming so like I'm into that it's fun but computer science is a super super broad field and I think basically anything my students are interested in I'm like oh yeah yeah you could be do you could do something with that in computer science right we just have a broad enough cool enough field that that's possible and it's not about assuming that women oh, women don't like Java programming, or women do like Java programming, or women do like humans or whatever. <clears throat> it's just like, oh, we like teach <coughs> classes with multiple people in them, and maybe each person is gonna have different interests. And computer science has so much breadth, you can be interested regardless of, you can have a lot of different interests and still find a home in computer science. And so we're not having to assume, we're not designing for women. We're designing for a multiplicity of interests. Like what if people brought themselves and their interests to computer science and then did cool things? Another thing we did was we split the intro course by experience. Have you ever had an instruction, like a class that was way too easy for you and you were like, this is not educational? Or a class that was way too hard for you and you were like, this is not educational? It turns out that's not a good way to learn when a class is designed for a different level of prior experience. And you're like, from an edge, you're not maybe computer science professors, but like, duh, right? And it also turns out sometimes people who have studied computer science can be super intimidating and like, but I was actually thinking, I was reading the API this weekend. First of all, 18 year olds say shit like that. Do you know what I mean? Where they're like, do you know what I mean? Stuff that no one would say around here, but just, and like, students in my class are like, I don't know what an API is, and maybe that's like, should I be reading APIs on the weekend? Like, so 
you split the intro class by experience, um, and that, that can help with some of these pieces. Uh, and some of my research students was like, you know, CS1, that's like an intro CS class, is like taking a foreign language class, but the majority of students are already native speakers. And you think that'd help you, but teachers adjust to the native speakers, so people who are new to the idea get left behind in the dust. And actually, at a lot of uh, undergraduate institutions, to be successful and to even be able to major in computer science, you have to have had high school experience. And then you look at the US high school uh, system, and you're like, oh, who has access to computer science instruction uh, in the US? Oh, it turns out it's not women, and it's not people of color. Um, and we can talk more about that. So we split it by uh, intro experience. Sorry, some uh, awkward animations. Uh, we have three different intro courses, so students with no experience, students with a little bit of experience, they do all the same stuff as the students with no experience, but they can learn it faster, right, because they've like already seen if statements and loops, and so we just teach them other esoteric stuff that's not going to confer an advantage in that next class, to so try and get those students up to the same point, point. and we combine two classes for the students with a ton of experience. Um, we need to recognize that learning takes time, and this is counter to some of our ideas, I get to, I have two more minutes. Is that right? Two more minutes, okay. I'm gonna end on time. Team, here's another quote from one of my students. They said, not at Harvey Mudd, even one of my professors told us that some people are just born that way with the mental outlook that's compatible with CS. They feel it's so easy for them, yeah, and he told the rest of the people that some of you will try, but you just won't get it. And it's just that your mental outlook isn't made that way. It's something you're born with. You can't help it. And I think this idea that computer science requires like a gene is one of the most problematic for us in thinking about expanding access to computer science. And like, I don't know a lot about biology, but computer science is like pretty new, and I don't think provides like an evolutionary advantage. And so like, I kinda don't understand how there would be like a gene for it. Do you know what I mean? Like maybe it doesn't make sense that there's a gene for it. Um, <clears throat> For this work, I would look at Carol Dweck. Talks about this idea that it, uh, ability is fixed and can't grow with time and learning. Uh, and the imposter syndrome is important in thinking about like, oh, people being concerned about their own performance. Uh, Claude Steele, uh, previously at UC Berkeley, talks about the ways in which stereotypes affect our lives. Rad book. Um, and the idea is yet. Your coworker that's crappy at their job, they're not good at it yet. It's not that they don't have some gene. It's not like they can't learn more things. Does anybody know how to do heart surgery? No? You could learn. Are you, do, do you not have the heart surgeon gene? No, but we don't talk about things like that uh, there, but we do with computer science. We also think at Harvey Mudd you should learn and teach about bias. Uh, I'd recommend you go to the Harvard Implicit Bias Test to talk about the ways in which you're aware of all these negative stereotypes, the ways in which those affect uh, your evaluation. There's a bunch of like really upsetting research where you're like, oh gosh, you're looking at resumes that are identical, but one has a woman's name on it, and so you're like, yeah, let's not hire her. And like big studies, read about it online. I recommend uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, and uh, Lean In has some helpful resources. There's some problematic pieces of it, and one of it, one of the problematic pieces is that Lean In is focused on teaching women to fit. Like, oh, so I'll tell you all this research about how industry is sexist, and then we'll tell you why, don't try to fix that, just try and navigate within it. And it, uh, it's just like, I need to be more confident. I'm broken, not that the systems around me that questions my intelligence, questions whether or not as a woman I have a geek gene is not the problem. We're gonna skip a joke. This is a really good book. You gotta build community, and we send students to Grace Hopper. At Harvey Mudd, we made CS Required. Your alma mater should make CS Required. I gotta, these slides are online, and I can also point you to links where I like talk more about these things. Um, and these are my book recommendations. And now I'll take questions, thank you. Team, I think I have four minutes for questions. Yeah? Can you go into more detail? You said um, both high school, for high school students in America, um, people of color and females have less access to computer science. Can you speak to females having less access? Yeah, 
because you're like, that's weird. Because it makes sense with people of color, because like our educational system, K-12, is super, super segregated. Um, and then we're not providing enriching opportunities like computer science at schools serving students of color. But the women one is weird. You're like, how is that happening? Here's the thing. It's an elective. Who decides if the student is going to take computer science? A lot of times it's a, a high school counselor. Who does the high school counselor think should take computer science? That plays a role. What parents are advocating for kids to take computer science? My mom didn't look at me and think, yeah, I got a computer scientist here. Do you know what I mean? And so, so it's about when it's opt-in classes, it relies on people's societal expectations of who should do it. And so what we see is at like the AP computer science level, about 20% of test takers identify as women. But that is about more than 50% of the calculus test takers identify as women. So we're seeing a huge imbalance, and I think it's this opt-in and who should do it. Other questions? Yeah? Montreal has women in IT, in case you didn't. the question side. Um, I heard someone telling me from a school last week that going to IT may not be the right thing because everything will be computer in the future. Every kids know how to navigate, how to program. So people should do more a side um, education like business, history, math, Yeah, okay, but I think the question, I should repeat the question for the video. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's like, you know, I really like computer science. I think it's super fun, but it doesn't mean everybody has to do computer science. But I think if we look at the fact that we have underrepresentation of women in computer science, I think we have to scratch our head and be like, that's weird. And I think, huh, maybe we're pushing people out of this field. There's no reason to believe that there would be a meaningful effect size and interest, you know? Computer science is a broad field with lots of opportunities. So there must be other things going on. And I think those other things are sexism, and we didn't talk about it much, but racism as well. And so I think, you know, do they need to do computer science? No, they can do lots of different things. But thinking about, oh, are we purpose, are we like pushing people out when we don't mean to? Yes, I think so. And so we should be worried about that. And one reason we should be worried about it is because computer science jobs are high paying and high status. Um, and it's fun. Uh, and so I think it's problematic if we're pushing folks out of high paying, high status jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can take one more question. Yeah. How much role do you think the media plays in portraying Oh my gosh, it's huge. So the question is about the how much does the media play a role? First, I think we still play a role in the stories that we tell about computer scientists, right? These stereotypes don't exist in a bath in a vacuum, not in a bathroom, in a vacuum. <laughs> we like repeat them and we perpetuate them with the stories we as humans tell. But you know, now I live in like LA. And I went to this event at Google where they were taught, they brought in producers of TV shows and the Gina Davis Institute is trying to get more women characters, lead characters in kids TV shows. Uh, and they are like, one of the TV shows was like, oh yeah, and then someone from Google called us and they were like, hey, that Latina in high school, why doesn't she learn to code? And we were like, okay. And so I, and so then the Fosters, like an ABC family TV show was like, oh, has this high school Latina coding? And I think it, you just need to like kick them in the pants a little bit to be like, oh, actually this could be plot points and the plot and the characters that you pick don't have to be super stereotypical. And Google at least is working on working with the, the industry um, to move forward on that. With this, I should probably cut it off, uh, but thank you so much. Thank you.